So now we need to spend some time looking at what are called the pi molecular orbitals. And we'll actually start with a molecule that's not conjugated uh, as an introduction, and then go and, and definitely apply it to all the conjugated systems we need to study here. So we're going to start with ethylene here. And so ethylene is just, you know, two carbons, so and some hydrogens. And then you've got these p orbitals that are going to overlap sideways. So, and that sideways overlap is what leads to the creation of both pi bonding as well as pi anti-bonding molecular orbitals. Now, if you guys recall, a p orbital has this node at the nucleus. So when it has this node at the nucleus, and therefore uh, you're crossing through zero, the wave function has a value of zero there, and therefore zero probability of finding an electron there. But on either side of it, on one side it's positive, on one side it's negative, and when you get this overlap like so, you have an option. Either the other one matches, and where they overlap, they have the same sign. We say they're in phase, and constructive overlap will occur. So and when that happens, that leads to the creation of a bonding molecular orbital, what we're calling psi 1. Some books will say pi 1, same diff in this case. Uh, and that creates the bonding molecular orbital. So constructive overlap always creates that bonding molecular orbital, whereas destructive overlap, so in this case, let's just say instead, this went the other way around, plus here, minus here, now I've got a positive lobe interacting with a no negative lobe, and right where they overlap here, they would cancel each other out, and it would create what's called a node. And sometimes in the molecular orbital diagram here, we'll draw a little dashed line just as a reminder where the node is, but anytime you cross over from one to the other, that's called a node. Now, instead of using pluses and minuses, what we usually do is give you a difference in shading. I'm using blue and green, and one's plus and one's minus, and it doesn't really matter which one is which. And as long as the blues are adjacent to each other and the greens are adjacent to each other, that is uh, bonding overlap. So in this case, and as long as blue is next to green or green is next to blue, that's anti-bonding overlap, so destructive overlap. Uh, and that's kind of the gist here. And so, again, uh, constructive overlap leads to bonding molecular orbital, and destructive overlap leads to an anti-bonding molecular orbital. That's kind of the deal here. With conjugated systems, it's get a little bit more complex. Uh, but a couple things we need to know. So with ethylene here, once again, we just have two carbons, each with a p orbital. And so the first off is we're starting with two p orbitals. And when you combine two p orbitals, it turns out there's two ways to do it. And so combining two p orbitals always leads to the creation of two pi molecular orbitals. So in this case, psi 1 and psi 2. So your lower half are always bonding. Your upper half are antibonding. And we signify that with this asterisk right here. That always uh, means antibonding. So the lower half bonding, the upper half of your orbitals that you draw are going to be antibonding. And again, starting with just two p orbitals involved in this pi system, that's why there's only two molecular orbitals. Now, one other thing to note, it looks like this lovely picture right here is two orbitals. But keep in mind, that's the drawing we make to represent one molecular orbital. What that really looks like here is that, you know, you've got a carbon atom right here and a carbon atom right here, and you've got a big lobe of electron density up here. That's what those two blue shaded regions actually represent is this big region of overlap. And then down below, you've got this big region of overlap as well. And so that's what this picture actually represents. It, you see, it looks like there's two separate p orbitals in it, because that's what was used to make it. But the truth is, what it really is, is a brand new molecular orbital here that results. And rather than drawing the results, we just usually draw the components and kind of expect you to know what it actually represents uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. So, but that's why I said there's just two molecular orbitals here, psi 1 and psi 2. And we constructed them based on you know composing uh, two p orbitals together and stuff like that, but the truth is it forms one big orbital. So here we get one big psi 1 orbital, and here we'd have one big psi 2 star molecular orbital. Now in this case, we see that we've got two pi electrons, it's only pi electrons we're going to worry about, and that's these two electrons right here. And now we have to identify what are called the frontier molecular orbitals. So the frontier molecular orbitals are where reactions happen for conjugated systems. So we identify the highest occupied molecular orbital. So, and that's the highest energy orbital in the system that has electrons. So that's this one here. We call it the HOMO for short. So then you have the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or sometimes the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. And that's the lowest energy orbital that's empty, and it's always right above the HOMO. So, and in this case, 
Uh, that's this guy here. And the reason these get a special name here, so it's got, this is where chemical reactions happen. So if you're going to act as a nucleophile, it's your highest energy electrons that would act as a nucleophile. Now, if you're going to act as an electrophile and accept electrons somewhere, you're going to accept them into your lowest energy empty orbital. And so these are where we can either act as a nucleophile electrophile, and that's why these get a special name, the frontier molecular orbitals. Now, for ethylene here, that's all we got. But we'll see with the other systems, there'll be more than just these frontier molecular orbitals, more than just the HOMO and LUMO. So one other thing we should take a look at here is if you kind of draw a dashed line right down the middle here, you'll notice that for Psi 1, it is perfectly symmetrical. And you'll notice for Psi 2, that it is exactly the opposite of the mirror image. And we say that when one side's the exact opposite of the mirror image of the other, that it is anti-symmetrical. And you'll find out that with the molecular orbitals, they alternate like this all the time. Psi 1 is always symmetric, and then Psi 2 anti-symmetric. And if we had additional orbitals, they'd alternate symmetric, anti-symmetric all the way up. The other thing is we talk about the number of vertical nodes. Now, if you look at Psi 1 here, so there's no vertical node there. So those are in the same phase, so no vertical node. Now, we have to say vertical node because there is always a horizontal node through the nucleus in any pi system. So we'll ignore that completely. We're only going to look at the number of vertical nodes. So here we've got zero vertical nodes. And it turns out every energy level you go up, you always gain an additional vertical node, one at a time. So, and that's why here with side two, there's a vertical node right here where they're out of phase. And so we have one vertical node. So and just kind of keep this in mind. With more complex systems that have more molecular orbitals, you always kind of see both these principles. You start out symmetric at your lowest energy orbital, and they alternate symmetric, anti-symmetric, symmetric, anti-symmetric. Anti so you also start with zero vertical nodes at your lowest uh, energy molecular orbital, and then you get one at psi 2, two at psi 3, three at psi 4, so on and so forth. We'll see these in the following conjugated systems.